Hey guys, Alex here. Now that you have a basic understanding of how to play Othello and in terms of controlling mobility and also a little bit on openings, today we would like to talk about end game counting. Hey everyone, so today we'll be talking about basic end game counting. So today's topics are A B counting, end game puzzles, and counting lines. So over here in this picture, there are some uh, students uh, playing Othello in a school tournament in Singapore. Now let's talk about A-B counting. So why do I call it A-B counting? So basically A-B counting is, uh, means counting two empties. It's basically A or B. So it's just A choice or B choice. So let's talk about end game counting methods. So there are essentially three basic methods to counting Othello. So there is the plus minus method, the cancellation method, and the visualization method. So over here, we have a puzzle that it's originating from Othello Quest. So if you download the application uh, Othello Quest, you would actually uh, see a menu that says study and you can choose puzzles. So this is basically a two empty square puzzle that came from the study section. So over here, you can either choose to play A1 or B1 over here. So if I were adopting a plus minus method, which is probably the most uh, common way to actually count end games, first, uh, you would actually count all the discs that you have. So right now, it is White's turn to play. Um, in this case, uh, actually, you already have the count of discs, which is 31 over here. But in an actual... Uh, game on the board, you would actually have to count up all the discs, which is uh, usually the case uh, when you're trying to count out an end game because you don't actively track the number of discs that you have at any given point in the game until you really want to count out the game. A plus minus method basically just means that if, let's say, white were to play A1, it would just be plus one disc, and then you expect black to play B1 which is flipping back this disc, so it's more like a plus one and minus one. So basically, in this situation, when there is a plus one and minus one, white doesn't really gain any disc except for the disc that he plays. So essentially, the final outcome is expected to be 32 to 32. So if right now, if white were to choose B1, it would actually flip one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven black discs. So after this, this has actually changed to white, and white has placed the white disc to B1, black would then finish the game by playing to A1. So essentially, white, black, white would actually gain plus seven black discs, and black would actually flip back six white discs with none along the diagonal. So using a plus minus method, we would actually calculate that as plus seven, minus six. So essentially white gains one disc on top of the disc that he plays and essentially would win the game with a score of 33 to 31. Now let's talk about the cancellation method. In the cancellation method, for something as uh, simple as a one disc uh, flip in a plus one minus one situation that we talked about with white going with A1 first, we actually uh, do realize that um, if that is the case, you realize that this B2 disc is actually cancelled out. So if you play the disc here and you cancel out this disc, you immediately just count plus 1 to your score and you actually get the final score of 32. And in the other situation uh, where you play B1 first, you actually cancel out these 6 discs while in exchange of these 6, these six discs that you actually obtain and you eventually plus 2 to your score and you get 33 to 31. In the visualization method, which is probably one of the hardest methods uh, to employ uh, in position counting, is that you visualize the entire shape on the board after the two moves are played and or the two moves that you're simulating and you basically visualize the entire outcome on the board and you count off the squares. So usually the visualization method uh, in a more complex situation almost seems impossible to do. 
um, unless you really have a, a very good uh, visualization capability. So the most common method and also the method that I choose to employ would probably be the plus minus method. So yeah, feel free to actually choose the method that you prefer. So right now I'd like to talk about end game puzzles. So over here, this is the front uh, interface uh, of the application Othello Quest. And over here, you can see a few options, play, you can watch, and you can view my page, which shows your own statistics. And finally, the relatively new option here is actually to study. So let's just go into the study option. So over here, you can actually find puzzles that are as simple as two empty squares, which we've seen in the AB counting earlier. And you can see puzzles that are as complex as eight empty squares. So you can actually just do the puzzles and they would actually track your progress. So starting from the simplest, which is the two empty squares puzzle, we can just jump right in. Um, so we've already completed the first puzzle that we've actually covered in the previous section of AB counting. And over here, this would be the second puzzle. So let's take a look at our options. Now it is Black's turn to play, and there are 31 black discs. Now if we use a plus minus method, we and we select G1, it's basically plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And of course, in return, white would play H1 if I, we play G1 and essentially take 6 discs on the horizontal line and 4 discs on the diagonal line, which is a plus 9, minus 10 situation, which is not favorable for black. In a plus 9 minus 10 situation, you basically lose one disc, and hence unable to win the game. So over here, if black would have choose H1 instead, it would be few, flipping fewer discs, but essentially going for a plus 1 and 2. And then finally, when white plays G1, it would be a minus 1 back. So it would be plus 2 minus 1. So counting the disc that black obtains, uh, during this exchange, which is a net, net plus one, and also the disc that is being played, you realize that black is able to win 33 to 31. So feel free to actually try uh, the next couple of uh, puzzles along the way, and you will realize um, as you continue to learn different types of uh, end games, you actually gain experience in counting, and you would then become more comfortable with uh, sim simple end games to begin with. And as you progress further, do try more challenging puzzles as you move up the, uh, along the way. So now let's talk about uh, counting lines. The different types of line counting that I would like to talk about today is the forced line counting, the multiple line counting, and also end game estimation. So basically, the first one being forced line counting is the simplest, is when a game is one-sided. Uh, so either you or your opponent basically has no choice. So assuming over here in this situation you are actually black, and you wanted to roughly estimate uh, what's the outcome uh, of the end game from here, it's pretty easy to count the best line because your opponent doesn't really have many options. Even though there are many squares on the board that are still unfilled, it's easy to actually play out sequences uh, being black that gives your opponent only one choice. So assuming if we were to target playing H7 over here and flip F5 and G6 uh, this over here, we would then essentially be resulting in a pass of move where your opponent doesn't have an option. And of course, if black goes to H8, and flips one, two, three discs over here. White would actually only have one option but to jump down to H8 and flip one and two discs, this being black after black has played H8. So that would result in a plus three, minus two situation. And if you just continue to visualize uh, that way with black playing A1 and A8, uh, resulting in a move only to B8 available for white, and with black finally playing either one of these options, you could actually count out the line fairly easily, even if it meant counting maybe five or six or even more consecutive moves, given that 
it is a very simple line and there is only one choice for your you or your opponent to actually play. So over here if you count the number of black discs on the board, 7 plus 6, 13 plus 4, 17 plus 5, 22 plus 3, that will be 25, plus 4 below, you get 29. So if you were to count out uh, an expected outcome of a certain forced line, you would go A1, for example. So you would have 29 plus 1, 1, 2, 3 discs. And after that, you would actually visualize yourself to actually have 32 discs. And you basically count out maybe A8, which gives you another 7 more discs over here and 1 and 2 more over here. So that would give you a count of 41. And basically, white would only have one option but to play B8, which is results in you having 40 discs. And you can then visualize uh, black playing, say, C8 with 40 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 1 and 2 when white plays D8. So that would actually be 43. And essentially, you would then add 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, resulting in 49 black discs, finally white flipping 1 to H8, which would give you a result of 48 to 16 for black to win. So if we just go back to that position earlier, you then understand that actually this is a forced line counting where basically the line is forced and it even though it is six or seven moves ahead, you can actually count out the line and estimate the result. Similarly, if you were to consider black starting off with d8, that would only give one option for white to respond in c8. You would, you would also be able to actually count out that way. So even though you might ask me, why is it so important to actually count lines? Especially when I'm already winning as black. I'm already winning by such a huge margin. Why does it matter? So usually the discount uh, matters uh, when it comes to world championships where many players could essentially have the same number of wins or basically the match points and would essentially rely on the Brightwell or that is comprised of the discounts within its formula to actually... Uh, decide on the tiebreaker. So essentially every disc would play a huge part to your final ranking which is also a good practice to actually maximize your disc regardless of whether you're winning by a huge margin or whether the game is in a tight position. So now let's talk about multiple line counting. Unfortunately for us, Othello is not always simple and the game is not always one-sided. Um, in a battle between uh, two players of similar level, you would probably encounter uh, games that are slightly more tight in the, the situation where basically there isn't a very clear-cut uh, advantage between, uh, both amongst, uh, between both players in any given game and the game could be a little bit more complex. So let's talk about uh, multiple line counting right now. So over here, uh, it is actually white's turn to play. Uh, white definitely has more than uh, one safe option over here. He, white could actually play either B1, C1, uh, maybe A8 being the corner, or even H7 and G2. So given that uh, white has so many options, and of course, uh, in response, black also has many legal options on the board, uh, there would be multiple lines possible in this end game. So definitely when it comes to multiple line counting, it would actually require uh, more knowledge in the game in order to determine where exactly is your best line and where exactly it's, is your opponent's best response. With the knowledge of knowing where you can play being your best bet and also where your opponent is likely to respond, you are then able to accurately predict the line that would actually be played out and essentially make correct assumptions. The fundamental underlying requirement of actually doing multiple line counting where there are so many boards on the squares yet to be occupied is essentially having the correct assumptions of how the game would actually play out and not maybe say play one move to B1 and 
expecting your opponent to play c1, but in actual fact, uh, maybe h3 is in response is actually the best move for your opponent, and you just get caught off guard. So it is important for Otello uh, when you are trying to do multiple line counting to actually have the correct idea and the correct uh, move anticipated in response. So over here, um, there is this concept uh, about parity, which is also an uh, endgame maneuver, which we'll cover in the future episodes, which essentially will help you determine where is the best move and your best chance uh, to actually resolve the game in a risk-free manner. So over here for white, essentially the best move is actually G2. G2 being it, uh, an odd region which actually gives white parity. So we'll cover the details about parity in the future. Finally, I would like to talk about end game estimation as part of line counting. So assuming if uh, you find the situation too complicated uh, to actually count out the specific line and due to the various options that your opponent may have, it's a good thing to actually have a bit of a end game estimation in mind. So what do I mean by end game estimation? So it basically means that you understand the dimensions of the board and you just try to estimate the result by knowing at least which lines or which areas of the board you would actually cover to uh, actually gain confidence in that particular sequence of moves that you intend to play out. So over here, if you are playing black, assuming it was your turn right now, if you started off with h1 and expect a response of white going into h2, you would immediately be able to cover a1 as well. And white may go to b2 or may go to essentially h8. Assuming you are unable to visualize the end result from here and you cannot count precisely, you can get uh, end game estimation by roughly understanding which edges you would capture. So you essentially already have the left edge as a stable disk, and by capturing h1 and h2 exchange, followed by a1, you essentially capture this lead diagonal, and also another uh, top edge. So if you consider the entire board dimension being 8 by 8, by securing 3 edges, you essentially have more or less at least 21 or 22 disks secured. And if you have a fourth edge, or disks that are roughly uh, that accounts for four edges, you would then be reassured that you have at least 28 disks. But understanding the dimensions of the board and knowing which lines you'll be able to actually capture and stabilize, you will then be able to have a confident uh, estimation, uh, especially in the situation where you may not have the time to precisely count out the best line, you would be able to figure out a sequence that it's a comfortable win. So assuming if black were to go h1 here, white goes to h2, black goes to a1, followed by white covering maybe b2, you would essentially grab a fourth edge over here and secure this edge as well. So five edges is probably more or less enough to win the game. And of course, if you estimate that white plays h8 in response, uh, you would actually be able to play g8 and capture one more edge down here and result in at least four edges for yourself. So let's see how that plays out. So basically you win comfortably with 41 discs. So with the edges or basically the lead diagonals in mind, you can actually perform a very comfortable estimate of the end game result. Even when you're probably short of time in a tournament, so with uh, basic endgame counting and uh, the basic ideas to actually approach an endgame, I would like to cover um, endgame maneuvers that actually help you take control of the game that you're leading in and to basically uh, just secure the win. So in the next few episodes, you would see basic endgame maneuvers uh, to actually secure your win. Thank you very much for watching my video and I'll see you in the future episode. Thank you.